Hello Watch Enthusiasts! Now today I'd like to continue my video episodes talking about different interesting but I feel underappreciated watches from different decades. Now that I've covered a great deal of the middle of the 20th century, I'd like to speak about the 1980s. Because the 1980s are by no means the period which you would most associate with wristwatch innovation and, and change, However, I feel this was a time of very interesting change, because it was a period when the entire watch industry was being turned on its head by the quartz watches of, of Japan. And so, a very interesting range of pieces in every price category were released during this time to counter the, the, uh, the difficulties that the Swiss watch industry was suffering. And this really was the point at which several visionaries saw the future of mechanical wristwatches as more than simply timekeepers from Switzerland, and as something different to market. And so whether you look at very affordable pieces or very high-end pieces, it really was a fascinating time of change. And before I begin the video, I would like to point out that um, my Zin 104 that you saw in the intro, along with my Seiko Marine Master 300, are still for sale, so if anyone is interested, then do drop me an email at the address which is in the description down below. Now amongst all of the watches in this video, I feel that perhaps the most important is this first, and whilst it's perhaps not the most interesting to speak about in terms of facts, conceptually it's a fascinating concept. And this is, of course, the Swatch. And the Swatch was a direct response to the fact that the Swiss watch industry couldn't compete with the, uh, the Far East from, uh, for example, Japan, with the production of quartz watches, which were viewed in the period as the future by the vast majority of people. And so, as a result, the Swatch was a remarkable rethink of how the Swiss watch industry could compete, because rather than producing ultra-high-end quartz watches, which were expensive to produce, difficult to sell, and, and just didn't work in a, a commercial context, the Swatch was something very different and a very interesting concept. The origins, though, of the Swatch were seen really in the 1970s in the luxury watch industry, which is an interesting area for, uh, for this concept to begin. And these began when, when engineers in, uh, in Neuchâtel worked on the Delirium uh, watches, and these pieces were produced for Concorde, and also these movements were used by other brands, but their, uh, their scope of production was never too large because of their particular form of, uh, of production. Because these movements and these watches had a key innovation, which was the fact that their quartz movements were built directly onto the case as a sort of monoblock form as the, the base plate of the movement, rather than having an independent movement. And this is very similar to some of the, uh, the, the Piaget Altiplano models, albeit in this case these were quartz, and so they could achieve a uh, much thinner build without the, the clever innovation which was required for the more modern Altiplanos from Piaget. And of course they also were, were very different in terms of their concept because of using quartz instead. But the result of these watches was the fact that they were luxury pieces at an incredibly slim thickness. Now one saw some versions which, uh, which were 1.98mm thick. Now, to put that into context, that's thinner than the vast majority of mechanical movements, with even ultra-slim mechanical movements coming in at significantly more than that. But even more interestingly, perhaps, they did produce in the form of the Delirium 4 a 0.98mm thick watch. That's the case, the crystal, the dial, the whole watch. And this wasn't, as I understand it, wearable due to the fact that the, the watch would simply bend, which is understandable, because really at that thickness the watch is, ceases to be a, uh, a viable dress watch and becomes an impracticality. But certainly this paved the way for the idea of the quartz uh, watch being integrated into the case like the Swatch. And the design of these pieces began in 1979, albeit in, uh, in, in secret, but then by 1981 there were working examples which were produced, and by 1982 there really were the, the final stages of development for the full release in November 1982 in the US, and then in Switzerland in March 1983. And the clever thing about the Swatch was that it provided this plastic case with the, the plastic crystal and a very simple three-hand design, although in fairness in 1973 there were day-date versions released as well. But the general designs were very sedate that year, with the very first being the, the GB101, which was a black and gold version, um, whilst other versions were also available that year too, as are, are displayed in this video, with uh, one modern one at the end. But the clever thing about these watches was they, they used the fact that quartz was more affordable and inset the movement directly into the case, so one didn't have an opening case back, but simply a hatch with which to change the battery. And the name for these watches was Cunning 2, developed by Nico Lopez, and this was a, a name which was derived from the words second and watch, the idea being that this watch wasn't a continuation of the concept of a watch as a luxury piece, but rather as a fashion item, which is clever and, and very interesting, and of course has really reshaped the way we look at watches today, with fashion watches being a very major component of the industry, and in fact in many ways a more important one than the luxurious watches which I do so enjoy talking about. But economically these were very clever too, because these were 20% the price of a, uh, a full piece, 
uh, or an, an equivalent piece rather to make, and they were able to sell them at 40% of the price, which uh, which made these very affordable, but also uh, very easily um, easily owned in terms of having several, or owning this watch as a way of wading into the Swiss watch industry, but without investing in the same way as one would otherwise have to. And really the key to this was full automation, the fact that these watches weren't made by hand, they were made by machine, which allowed these watches to be something very different on the market, and something which allowed you a bit of fun with your watches without the seriousness of a very high price tag. And of course the fact that these watches were developed then further with the fact that uh, Nikola Ayek then restructured the, the, um, the, the companies SSIH and ASUAG, which were then merged in 1985 to form SMH, which is the Société Suisse de Microélectronique et d'Horlogerie, which then became the Swatch Group, and due to its purchases of a number of brands, ultimately resurrected the Swiss watch industry, which really has put a lot of weight on this small plastic watch, which, which revolutionised the way we look at the Swiss watch industry as a whole. For the luxury side of the Swiss watch industry, the 1980s were also a time of upheaval and great change. And on the opposite side of the spectrum, the opposite end of the spectrum rather, to the Swatch, was Blancpain. And this story has been told before by Jean-Claude Bivard himself uh, during his interview with Ardinki, which if you haven't watched I would strongly encourage you to watch because the man really is a force of nature and a fascinating man in terms of showing an insight into the watch industry. But in this video I'd like to talk about this story of the rebirth of Blancpain in a slightly different perspective um, or, or way, which focuses more on the technical side than the um, the story which is so well told in that interview. And this was a time of major change because Blancpain was bought in the early 80s from Omega by Jean-Claude Biver and Jacques Piguet. And so due to Omega being restructured in the early 1980s, in 1981 Jacques Piguet was able to acquire Blancpain as the manufacturer which was oldest, it, uh, it had been running theoretically since 1735. And the aim with this brand was to recreate the, the classical side of the watch industry, and the interesting thing is that, um, that this was putting a very different spin on Blancpain, which had been known for the 50 Fathoms and for dive watches before this point, so very different to what Blancpain is today and what was created in the 1980s. And the answer to all of these problems was a set of six masterpieces, if you will. They were six 33mm dress watches produced in those classical of styles, with, uh, with six major complications between them, and they were all released between 1982 and 1989. And the early pieces came in the form of the Perpetual Calendar and the, the Moon Phase Calendar, so the Cantième à phase de Lune, as well as the Cantième Perpétuelle. And these pieces used the, the base calibre of the automatic um, FPG 953, which was a somewhat old-school movement but worked very well in both, and then the, uh, the, the Moon Phase version used the, the Module 65 on top to create the calibre 6595. Now later versions of this did then pr did then come with the, the caliber 1153 with this same module on the top and that created the the caliber 6553 and also there was a manually wound version the 6501 and together these pieces created a very balanced watch with a pointer date and a beautiful case in uh, in different tones of gold and this really did celebrate the the aims of Blancpain during this period but the perpetual calendar also used that same caliber except the module with this one was the 53 on top and this also updated to the 1153 movement, with a module 54, which gave the leap year indication, which was something not seen on the original 1982 versions of the perpetual calendar. And so these formed the backbone, really, of this range, and were added to with the ultra slim. And this piece was released slightly later on, and it used the caliber 21, which took the caliber 99 from FP gear, and then increased the beat rate from 18,000 vibrations per hour to 21,600. And so this allowed the watch to move from 2.5 Hz to 3 Hz, and interestingly this movement was also used by Bédic Philippe as the, the, um, the calibre 177, which I think is rather interesting and, and shows the, the history of this movement as, uh, as something of a, uh, a standard movement as an ultra-slim calibre. Perhaps the most archaic looking of all of these movements was the Minute Repeater, which had an exquisite calibre 33. And this movement really did look like a pocket watch movement, with a number of uh, very horizontally orientated bridges and plates, and didn't really look like a modern calibre in the normal sense, but was a thoroughly beautiful manually wound piece to look at from the side, and used a um, type of uh, toggle or switch to be able to engage and disengage that, uh, that minute repeater function. But it really is an exquisite model, and, uh, and certainly through the exhibition case back, this piece was, was quite a piece to behold. And then there was also a chronograph version, which was a rattrapant chronograph to add functionality to the standard concept of a chronograph. And this used, used a, a variant of the 1180 calibre, which was released in 1987. 
and when it was released, this FPA movement was the thinnest chronograph ever produced at 3.95mm thick, and this was made somewhat thicker by the module being placed on the back as the rattrapant function in the 1181, which was released in 1988. And this also did form an automatic version, which was the 1186, and, uh, and this piece had 30 joules, or 38 for the automatic version, and really the beauty of this movement was very clever, with an extra column wheel to be able to, to add that rattrapant or that, um, uh, that split-second functionality to the chronograph, and is an interesting blend of a classical design with a much more modern function in this form. And then a truly beloved version is the tourbillon, which came with a calibre 23 with an 8-day power reserve, and a free-sprung balance within that to that tourbillon. But what I find most interesting about this piece, aside from the exquisite look of the movement, was the fact that because of the way it, uh, it was wound up, it would wind as though one was simply giving it two days of power reserve, rather than having to wind it for a very long period of time, giving it eight days. So you have this interesting balance of, of luxury with functionality, which I think is wonderful to see. But what's most important about these watches is that they show that the industry could still produce a luxury mechanical watch, and that it would still be accepted as something more than simply a timekeeper. These were little pieces of, uh, of craftsmanship, and they were works of art in their form, their quality, and their sheer beauty. And whilst the size of these watches was, was uh, bumped up to 38mm in the 90s, the form remains to this present day, making these a very important watch from the period. Now the next piece I'd like to speak about actually came with a very similar concept in terms of the ideals behind the brand as that Blancpain which I spoke about. And this is the Chrono Swiss CH6322, which is, in truth, the original regulateur from the brand. And Chrono Swiss has become extremely well known in recent years for the regulator style, and this really was the, the genesis moment, the beginning of this concept, which came out in the mid-1980s. But to understand why this watch makes it onto the list, I think one has to look at why the brand was founded and by whom. Because it was founded in 1983 by Gert R. Lang, who worked for Hoyer previously and had been part of their, uh, their motorsport timing um, uh, section. But he created this brand with the name Chrono Swiss because it was a German brand, and I think that um, this does appear a bit confusing when you consider the fact that uh, it was called Chrono Swiss. But the reason for this was because it was a celebration of the Swiss tradition of watchmaking, and the way in which Swiss watchmaking had been. And so really this was one of the very early believers in the fact that actually one could, um, one could have a successful brand celebrating the mechanical side of the Swiss watch, Swiss watch industry, without that, uh, the, that, that direction towards quartz, which was seen as the future by most, most producers of watches, and certainly at this slightly more affordable price range than, than Blancpain, I think that it's, uh, it's, it's very understandable that there was, there was concern that this, simply, this market simply didn't exist anymore. But I think it's rather remarkable that Lang was able to, to, to engineer this brand towards that, that gap in the market, which, which today, of course, has flourished. And I think the regulator is important because the fact that this watch was able to succeed as it did, and the fact that nowadays Chrono Swiss doesn't so much look at the past of watchmaking, but rather looks to the future with, with new and rather clever designs, does show that it was a success and that this, this concept was, was an interesting one. Because the regulator is a concept which was originally taken from the, the clocks used for timing chronometers and, and, um, and regulating watches, and so that the, uh, the minute hand was the most predominant feature on the dial, it was placed separately from the hours and the seconds in the centre of the dial. And this was the first brand to, to adopt this as a, a wristwatch form, and the fact that the mechanical side of these watches was celebrated is seen in the fact that they had exhibition case backs, which displayed the, the Unitas manual calibre 126 on the back, which was modified to have this regulator layout. And of course it goes without saying the design of these watches very much shaped the way the, the brand went in future, with those without that rather strong profile for the lugs, with that knurled bezel, with that, that onion crown. But I think most important to this is the conceptual side for the whole industry, the fact that uh, you could celebrate the past in a way which simply wasn't possible previously, and the fact that you could be successful doing so. Now this penultimate piece is an interesting model in that it recreated Hoyer from a racing brand to a far more broad brand, which I think in many ways forms what, uh, what Tag Hoyer was, and I feel that nowadays they are, they are changing the brand quite significantly, and I think for the better, it must be said. But I think that uh, this watch, the, the Hoyer 844, shaped the, the concept of Tag Hoyer away from racing and towards a much, a much more broad concept. And the 844 was released in 1979 and ran through approximately 1990, and produced the, the backbone of, the, the, of that sort of brand, with a 200 meter water resistance, 42 millimeter case with this beveled style and these very large crown guards, and formed really the, the predecessor for the 1000 
1500, 2000 and later lines of dive watches. And there was also the quartz version of this watch, the 980, which was also important, but really the, the, um, the backbone in my eyes and the, or the origin was the mechanical version, the 844. And the 844 came in, in six generations, which is incredible, really, in the short, uh, short period of time it was produced for. But this allowed the watch to, to move, really, from, from production in France to Switzerland. Because originally this watch wasn't even produced by Hoyer, it was produced by Georges Monin in France. And so on the original versions, the 844, one sees a made in France on the dial, um, as well as the fact that this watch, um, this version, this early version, didn't have any loom on the bezel, and also had this rather curious red 24-hour graduation on the dial, with the addition of cathedral hands rather than later versions. The next stage for these watches was the 844-1, and this was also produced by Georges Monat in France instead of Hoyer, as a result of the fact they, they, as it can be assumed, weren't sure the watch was going to be a success, and thus was marked as, as French-made. These also still had the 24-hour graduations on the dial, and also interestingly, um, like the original version, had professionnel on the dial rather than professional, which is a curious aspect of the fact these were French. However, this watch really shaped the way that, uh, that this watch was, because it now had Mercedes hands, it also had uh, new text on the dial, and was a piece which really also uh, made the watch more of a professional dive watch, with loom on the bezel as well. And it was with this watch that Hoyer realised that this was uh, an important piece, and a piece which was was popular enough to be produced by them in-house in Switzerland, which gave the uh, the, the production of the 844-2 a um, uh, sort of a point. And this version was Swiss-made, and, and had a much more conventional appearance, with uh, the, the professional text on the dial rather than the French version of the word, and also still had that, uh, that Mercedes style, whilst losing the 24-hour graduations. And it was with this watch it took on this Rolex Submariner-esque design, which became so popular, albeit in a much closer to Submariner form in later versions, in later Hoyer dive watches. And of course this version updated its movement too, bearing in mind that it was no longer French-made, and so it moved from the automatic FE4611A movement used in the French models to the far more well-known ETA2872. And a few tweaks were made to this watch in later days, Notably, it went on through the 844-3, 4, and 5, with the 5 being probably the most, most abundant, because this was produced from 1985 until the end of production, which was the version with Tag Heuer on the dial, rather than simply Heuer. And really, in my eyes, the rarest would be the second French version, with the Mercedes hands, because whilst one sees quite a few of those cathedral hand 1979 versions, it's very difficult to find that transitional model with an original dial rather than versions with rather, rather poorly imitated reproduction dials. So if you do ever come across one, I must say they are rather rare. But the reason why this watch deserved to be on this list was because, whilst technologically it was no marvel, I think the fact that these watches were able to change the, 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 the path, the course of, of production, and the course of development that Hoyer had towards a brand which didn't simply disappear through the, uh, the quartz crisis, but rather was bought and maintained by TAG, really says, uh, says volumes about this watch's importance and its popularity. Because this watch allowed Hoyer to, to build on this more, of more affordable version of Submariner concept, and of course through that 980 model there were quartz versions produced, which became very popular, and indeed uh, formed a, a very respected line, which was a fifth the price of a Submariner during its early days, but certainly was still a piece which, which offered you a lot of that dive watch enjoyment and functionality for a, for a more affordable price. Now the final piece in this video is a watch which is not so much a technical masterpiece, or a piece which is particularly memorable for that reason. Instead, this is a watch which redefined a part of Omega's design, which, which was becoming rather aged by the start of the 1980s and this was the Omega Constellation Manhattan. And it was a redesign of the Omega Constellation which began its life in 1952, alongside the Omega Seamaster, which started four years before it. And the Constellation was designed to be the range-topping line from Omega. It was a line of chronometer-certified watches, with movements which were really tested to a phenomenal level. In fact, these were produced to, according to many, higher standards where, uh, where, where testing was concerned than equivalent Rolexes during the period. And with their exquisite pipan dials and their gorgeous angular lugs, those 1950s and 60s pieces really were models of, uh, of, of incredible design and beauty. But by the 1970s, these designs were becoming, uh, becoming expensive, and Omega was having to, uh, to make less expensive pieces, it was as simple as that. Their movements in the thousand range of calibers were never really up to the standards of the 500 line, which famously were used 
in those earlier constellations, and they were less reliable, their designs were, were less incredible, and, and they weren't really the luxury pieces which they'd previously been. And so by the early 1980s, real reform was needed, and Omega certainly received that with the Manhattan. And the redesign was, was created by Carol Dersheim, who was able to, to create this integrated bracelet piece, which it did very much tie into the sort of uh, zeitgeist of the period of integrated steel bracelets. Although this piece, I feel, was very different to uh, models which existed from other brands, like the, the Vacheron Constantin Overseas, the Audemars Piguet Royal Oak, and of course the, the, the Batek Philippe Nautilus, because this was a very different price range. But also Omega tied in with other pieces in their range, such as the Omega Seamaster 120, which was uh, at the time a quartz watch which came in that uh, Jacques Mayol form, which has become very popular in recent years, which also had a similar arrangement of integrated bracelet and, and stout shape to the case. But this piece came with these very clear hinges in the, in the bracelet, which I think are very interesting in terms of their form. And the dial of the watch was very flat, with a flat sapphire crystal which covered both the bezel as well as the dial. And these are interesting in the sense the early versions featured this, um, this style of two claws which held the crystal down, which covered the dial and the bezel alike. And in fact, on later versions, as you can see on today's version, one no longer has this, um, this, this, this covered bezel. Instead, the bezel was also metal, usually a contrasting gold colour to the steel, and, uh, and was, was not part of that, uh, that, that sapphire crystal assembly. But the general design of these watches has remained in production until the present day, which is quite remarkable, I feel. Especially since, to some, this design is a bit dated, but personally, to me, I think it's very distinctive and, and quite attractive. But those claws going over the sides of the case have certainly become very distinctive, and these watches were available from the start, because these watches were technically available from 1981, although in truth 1982 was most likely the time when they were most, uh, most easily accessible. And these pieces were, were available in steel, two-tone steel and gold, or indeed in solid gold as well. Like the Seamaster 200 of this period, also with its integrated bracelet, these watches were originally offered with quartz movements, and the quartz movement in this watch was a chronometer certified, and of course with the, the, um, the necessary chronometer certification for a quartz movement, caliber 1422, and this was based on the ETA Flatline 2, and an offer day a chronometer certified movement which was able to give very high accuracy, as was to be expected from a quartz movement. And also this, this defined the shape of these watches as very slim, and once these, uh, these watches changed their thicker, more rounded form in later years, with that, um, that metal bezel, these watches adopted an, an automatic calibre as well, being the calibre 111, which was based on the ETA 2892-2, and this came in 1985 in a chronometer certified version. And whilst my favourites of this line came in the form of the originals, because I think their sharp angular forms combined with that hinged bracelet looked really quite remarkable, I can certainly see how the development of this design through the late 80s and 90s was very important to the rebuilding of Omega. And certainly these were very popular pieces, although nowadays they are much less popular. I do think that, uh, that as a design they were really quite brilliant, and uh, marked probably the most impressive product from Omega in the 1980s in terms of, of design and appearance, and one of these designs which really stood the test of time and, and survived. And the breadth of appeal of this design is quite remarkable, because whilst they were marketed at, at women through advertising using Cindy Crawford, I think it's, it's still remarkable the fact that, uh, that Gorbachev wore a solid gold version of these watches as, um, as leader of the USSR, so it, it's an incredible design in terms of its, um, its, 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 its fascination and its, its capturing of that period, both the modern eye from the present day looking back, but also at the time from the perspective of someone buying an Omega. And this is why I think this deserves a place on this list. But anyway, I'll conclude this video here, but do tell me in the comments down below what you thought of the video, and indeed what you thought of, uh, of the pieces which I've chosen to put in it, because I'm always interested to hear what you think, and I think the 1980s were a strange period for watchmaking, but also a very hopeful period in terms of, of really redefining the aims of the watch industry, and specifically the Swiss watch industry. And if you enjoyed this video, then do please like, share and subscribe to help the channel, and also to be able to see more videos and content here in future. Also, do follow me on Instagram under the address of Arm on the Watch Guy, which is now on the screen, to be able to see more content which otherwise wouldn't be available here on the channel. So thank you very much for watching. This is Arm on the Watch Guy, out.